Welcome, everybody. Um, hopefully, we'll get some more people coming back from lunch. <laughs> but um, so, you know, the, the, the guys here um, have experienced m and um, some in IPO or dealing with some public companies. But, you know, for us to make this interesting, you know, I'd like for these guys to also, you know, not only share with us kind of, you know, what their backgrounds are, but their experience in an m and and something that, you know, I think for us is remember. Uh, uh, something that the audience can really take that you know is useful, um, and please share that experience when you whether you've sold a company, you've acquired a company, uh, and also please um, you know share your backgrounds uh, as well. So, uh, Ferry, go ahead. Um, so yeah, my name is Ferry. I basically st started to um, to be involved in the startup scene of Indonesia back in two thousand nine. Um, so at the time, I was uh, founded. Uh, daily deal company. Uh, it was called distrus.com. Um, so I've gone through um, 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 exit once, which is around 2011. Um, sold the company to to Groupon. Um, you know, same with Kaylee here at the time. Um, you know, Groupon Malaysia, and we are Groupon Indonesia. Uh, and then after that, um, I founded another company called Bilna.com, which is basically focusing on um, mom and baby products. Um, focusing on e-commerce and media platform for mom and baby. Um, and then uh, two years ago, um, we did an m and with a um, similar company from Thailand, which is called Moxie, um, you know, which is becomes Orami now. So um, that's a bit of my background. So I've, I've, I've gone through one exit and one M&A, uh, one, one um, you know, looking for more in the future. And your experience of going through this, I mean, what are like a tidbit that you would like to share, I think, with the audience, you know what I mean, from your experience of going through this? Um, so I think first um, is the exit, right? So I did my exit um, in 2012. Um, like the previous um, session, we, we learned that, you know, back then the startup scene of Indonesia is totally different than um, how it is today. Um, at the time, you know, I got my first investment from East Venture. And then um, about a year and a half after that, um, the company was acquired by, by Groupon. So, um, you know, as a founder, you know, coming in from the founder's perspective, um, I think uh, my, my, my experience through this, you know, M&A and, 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 and exit has been on focusing on building the company, right? Um, at the time, we didn't expect a lot on 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 um, on being acquired by Groupon. The focus of 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 us is just you know to build the company, acquire the market, um, you know grow the business. Um, and I think Paul, you also have the similar experience uh, running Deal Karen at the time, so um, which is then acquired by by, well, by Living Social. What did you right? and your founders do like after the check cleared, right? After the money got into the bank, like what was the first thing that you guys did? So at the time it was quite early, right? Like like startup scene is 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 quite early in Indonesia. So to us, you know, after we exit Groupon, we just see this huge opportunity in the market, you know, um, especially seeing how how um, you know this does grow from nothing to to more than two million customers in um, less than a year. We just feel that you know this is this is uh, the beginning of something big, right? So that's why uh, you know after the exit, we just uh, you know started get right back into the game. Um, you know, started an e-commerce. Um, the inspiration also come from, um, from our time in Groupon that there is a huge market in the space of mom and baby and female in, the, in the, um, you know, Indonesia and Southeast Asia. So, um, you know, we just really want to get into the game uh, because we think that it's the early stage. And, you know, um, right now I think the, the space is much more mature. A um, lot of, lot of more, you know, a lot of exit, a lot of M&A also coming up. So, um, you know, we're just really excited. As a true on serial entrepreneur, you just jumped right into your next one. Uh, con congrats. And, and Kylie, I, I know you've, you've had a, a you know, couple of exits. And, and what, you know, from your experience, like, as an entrepreneur, now you're on the VC side, right? But as an entrepreneur, something that you can share with the group, um, you know, in terms of your experience. Yeah, I think I think both sides of the table, you, you kind of see an interesting number one. You see a certain kind of physics to what an M and A deal, an exit for a company is like, right? On both sides, right? There's a push and pull, right? And what are the dynamics of that? Um, secondly, is that we also kind of look at timing, because back when uh, we were selling our group buying companies, you know, at the time, if you get a 
if you if, if you even raised money at all, it was like big news. And if you sold a company, it's also big news. These days, you, if you don't sell your company for a billion dollars, it's not really news, right? I mean, and so the amount of num- the digits itself, it, it was the same thing in the Valley where back then when you would, um, uh, when let's say YouTube was acquired by Google, that was for a couple hundred million, I think at 400 million, that was like huge news, right? And then right now, that's small in comparison to like 19 billion in WhatsApp. So I think that's another axis of that is the timing of things. So to give a bit of background for myself and how I observe this, um, first company similar to uh, Ferry, one of the earlier generation of group buying companies got acquired by Groupon. Um, after that, I created an uh, online news company and became the largest uh, uh, traffic, most trafficked online news company in Malaysia. Um, I worked with Patrick Grove over here at Catcher Group. We got it uh, listed on the Malaysian Stock Exchange. Uh, we went out then. That that was the time that we became a buyer. We went out to look for the Malay uh, news sites, the Chinese news sites, buy them up, inject our monetization formula in it, and make it number one. And just make sure it keeps on churning cash and printing cash. So we just focused on, I think what you said was just like building values. We just start, you know, just kept on trying to get money away from competitors. And next thing you know, earlier this year, the traditional media company uh, in Malaysia called Media Prima, they, they couldn't stand it anymore. They're like, well, you're taking away a lot of this digital revenue. Facebook's taking the digital money. Google's taking the digital money. You guys are taking digital money. I can't buy Facebook. I can't buy Google. You know, I'm going to buy you guys. And so they took, it, they took the entire asset off the stock exchange. Um, now, in between all of that, of course, I became an investor in 500 startups. We are the most uh, active seed stage investor in the world, but in Southeast Asia specifically, even more. We've done 210 investments across four funds in Southeast Asia in the past four years. Uh, we were early in Grab, early in Carousel, early in Bukalapak, and a few others. Um, um, and so along this way, we've seen a fair share of M&A as well. Small, unnamed ones which don't get on the news, you know, some kind of like equi-hire types, you know, all the way to um, larger ones like Kudo being acquired by Grab for 100 million bucks, which is kind of like ancestral if you think about it, right? <laughs> because you've got this loop of buyer-seller, both sides of the table, timing. So with that in mind, I would say that like just observing the needs and wants on both sides of the table, yourself as an entrepreneur or yourself as an investor or VC, what do you want out of this outcome? Being very upfront and open with the other stakeholders and then looking on the buy side as well, right? Trying to get to a point where you can have authentic conversations of what really matters to them. That's when you're going to land on a deal that everyone's going to be happy about. But of course, getting to that level of authenticity, that's the that's Yeah, part of the and so I think it's interesting that you, you came from also the buy side or you had experience in the buy side and as you started to talk to companies that you were looking at acquiring right uh, what was that strategy because i mean you know you you have you you hear a lot of the the strategies from the big corporates where 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 they said if you if we don't acquire you we're going to acquire your number two and destroy you it's a very threatening type of acquisition strategy right so from your perspective like how did you how how did you uh, acquire you know or approach these companies and how did you you know i mean to convince them right well Definitely, like, each category is different. Each kind of generation of founder is quite different. But I'll tell you that specific stories from uh, buying companies in media at the time. Most media companies at the time, media owners, they're kind of profitable. And they are usually editorial run, editorially founded, you know, so they got certain idealism about their craft and, 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 you know, their brand and everything. But they're making money and they got good traffic. So they're more or less like, why do I need you? Why should I sell this? I've built my company for years. This is who I am. Like, why am I selling this, Right. And then so, that's when you kind of got to weave a bit deeper into psychology. What we found was a common thread for a lot of media uh, entrepreneurs was that, yeah, they built this company, they love it, everything, but it's hard work, right? And they pay themselves dividends. So when I say that, okay, you know, your profits at the end of the year, you're going to pay yourself dividends. That's 1x money. Now, the same earnings, or the same profit you have in this year if you could get a multiple on that, like 20x, 30x, 25x, so look at all the public media companies, you know, they got like 15x average. What if you got 15x? Same work. You own your, your company, continue doing what you do. Do you want to lead a 1x life or do you want to lead a 15x life? Now think about your family. What do you want for your kids? How much you want to save? What was the stuff you always want to buy? So it's kind of like the getting into the psychology of what they really want. Now, of course, this doesn't work very well for maybe other categories. Maybe like you're, you're feeling a company which is really hot, right? And then they have tons of people giving them acquisitions, offers. Like for ourselves, um, along the way, we had, uh, when I was an entrepreneur building says itself, we had two acquisition offers which we had to think about very, very seriously. But we swung for the fences and worked with Patrick instead to do a partial exit for a longer strategy. 
the deal I did with Patrick, me on the sell side, he on the buy side, one year. It took one year for that deal to happen. And it's that relationship building, that kind of patience to go in. You know? But I'll end over here and kind of you know, try to tap in there. I was actually so, really excited yeah. to kind of have you on stage because seeing you know, Asia, OLX. Like, yeah. Oh, thanks. And, uh, and, and I'm excited to be on stage with you because... Um, OLX, uh, what we do is classifieds. Uh, we are building the most exciting classifieds company in the world. We've started ourselves in many markets like India, but for example, here in Indonesia, we've bought a company. In Philippines, we've bought a company. And we've got in our company many founders like yourselves. Uh, and that makes it also exciting for us because that energy, that passion to really build a business. Um, uh, that is certainly something that I love and uh, uh, certainly something that helps us on our mission of becoming the most exciting classified company in the world. So uh, good to share a stage. <laughs> yeah, and, and so the, um, I met the founders for Sulit in the Philippines. And, you know, I, this was actually right when that happened. And it was very big news, you know, a Filipino company being acquired by a global or regional. How do you keep those guys motivated? You know, from a buy, when, as a buyer, right? I mean, yes, you have the earnouts, um, but even post earnout, you know, I mean, like, how do you keep them motivated inside the business? Yeah, no, Arie, uh, RJ and Arjen, they, yeah. they've built an incredible company in the Philippines, uh, and like them, uh, by now, uh, yeah, they've uh, they've signed out and they've they've taken their last paycheck, yeah. uh, but they've been with the company for ten years and many years whilst we were yeah. already the owner of the company. Uh, and, uh, and what do we do? Um, we enjoy the energy that they put in uh, and we make it worth their while. So uh, for sure, there's a financial element, but we also create the right environment. We give them the empowerment that, that they love. Uh, we support them in building the company bigger rather than try and impose all kinds of crazy structures upon them. Uh, and uh, I, I guess it's also a, co a corporate culture. Our shareholder, Nespers, um, they've been operating in this way for years and years, and, uh, and, and it's part of the DNA. Uh, every once in a while, we've got a Founders Appreciation Day, where we get all the founders together, and, uh, and we just do awesome stuff together. Uh, we create an environment that is really, really welcoming for founders. That's, that's what we do. I think from the NASPERS model, I, I, they have a very you know, interesting one where you know, they, they put in the CFO. Right into every startup or every company they they, they acquire. Um, how does you know a corporate like CFO or it may, maybe not corporate, but you know how how is that relationship like with a CFO and the and the founders? I mean, is it you know where the founders are learning from the CFO or you know or is it just very curious how an acquisition and, and that structure works? Yeah, as as part of the support, we try and share as much best practice as we can. And by injecting either a CFO or other people into the team to make sure that, uh, that we've got that cross-country learning. Um, uh, we like doing that, but we're not stuck up about it. And, and do you ever move like a founder? I mean, for me, when I saw Joel actually step up in Groupon, right, to run like bigger roles, that was a rarity. Um, you know, to see a founder take on bigger responsibilities. Has anyone in OLX taken on that bigger responsibility? No, completely. Um, uh, for example, um, Miguel, who founded the, both the horizontal as well as the two winning classif uh, vertical classified sites in Portugal, uh, he has stepped up. He has stepped up into a global role, and now he is disrupting the housing business in a number of countries. It's... Uh, no, it's, it's exciting. We, uh, yeah. We've unleashed his entrepreneurial energy on a <laughs> larger stage. Yes, and, um, uh, uh, and, and there's a lot of energy there. So all that it needs is a little bit of support. Uh, no, it's, uh, yeah, it's great to see. Um, and, uh, th thanks for that. And, and it's really interesting because, you know, in every founder's journey, right, like whether it's a small M&A, um, you know, Kylie, I think, has experience across buying, selling, um, you know, just would love to get you guys' take on just two things. One is, you know, the, the likelihood of a company really going IPO here, right? And, you know, from my, my, my take on the market is that it is, you have to defend against China, India, U.S., Europe, right? And as all these companies are trying to come in and, you know, you think about how you would have to compete against these guys or sell to them, right? So 
if you want to compete against them, you're going to compete locally. But at the same time, if you're not expanding out, right, as on region wide or even outside of your comfort zone, that's the only way to really fight them, right? Which is, you know, how I see the Chinese companies now going expanding outside of China, meaning Tencent, Alibaba being very aggressive, you know. And so, in some ways, you know, I, I see that the likelihood of a company being able to defend itself in Southeast Asia in the long term is fairly going to be pretty tough, right? Because you have all these big forces. So, you know, I'd love to get your input on, you know, what is the take on, you know, companies here, the ability to go IPO. Is that IPO sustainable, right? As in, you know, Garena or, or South SEA, right? So I'd love to get you guys' take on, because, you know, we talk a lot about IPO, right? But what is the real opportunity, I mean, just from your perspective, um, you know, in your, on that? Yeah, maybe I'll take a first stab at this. I think there are two things going on. Um, the first of which is that the M&A scene, like you said, like uh, there's a lot of big players coming in. We're from China for a while, so the rise of the big players. What's happening is not over here in this space. It's not unique to Southeast Asia. It's actually happening around the world, which is the rise of small M&A. So I don't have like slides on me, but like there's a quite a popular slide showing the rise of small ticket M and A sub hundred mil kind of M and A's over the years. That's going up. Next one, there's another slide of like corporate M and A's by traditional companies buying tech companies. That's going up, and even like just smaller and smaller cap uh, acquisitions by tech companies themselves, tech startups buying tech startups like Grab buying Kudo and so on and so forth. Said that's also going up. So you got a rise of small M and A very fast. On the other side of it, for IPO and exit, you got the delay of IPOs, right? You wait till all of the VCs have taken money off the table, secondary folks coming in and buying a lot of stuff on the table, and maybe when there's like so big, and then okay, maybe I'll do an IPO a bit later. So there's a delay in IPO because the public market's not really re rewarding the, the, the value of the company as much as the private capitalists. So you get this delay. So this bifurcation of excitement, right? One on getting early and earlier M&As, and one on later and later IPOs, that impacts founders tremendously. Because if I'm going to talk to Ferry on your next company, I'm like, hey, do you want to exit today at like 50 mil? Or do you want to like maybe eight years later do your IPO at like um, 2 billion? You know, founders got to think about that. Yeah. Right? Then VCs got to think about, should I encourage my company to sell now? I mean, get a, like one and a half X on my check, three X off my check. Or should I like, swing for fences, go for 50x in seven years? What's the chances of that? So we're at that point right now, not just in Southeast Asia, but I think everywhere. And, and what percentage do you see where it's going to be more small exits in Southeast Asia versus IPO across like, all the value? Well, well you see, my, my perspective is as, as an early seed stage investor, I'm happy with small m and I, in fact, I'm happy with small IPO. If, if they're gonna if they're gonna like list on ASX or they're gonna do something local or maybe, I, and sometimes they're not very small. Like Zerpass listed on the Filipino Stock Exchange, and then and at, at one point they were up 850 million USD. That's like that's like a big deal for a bootstrap company going to Filipino Stock Exchange. So, as a, from my perspective, I'm very happy to have a lot of small M&A because if I'm investing at say a million dollar valuation, they get so for. $4 million valuation just a year later, I, I still make 4x in one year. So the IRRs, they start, start stacking on my fund. That builds momentum of fund returns. And so I, I'm cool with that. That's cool. I think as a founder, I truly believe as, you know, um, the path to IPO is about the founder, right? About how you build the company, how you create value to the customers. That's basically the, the, the fundamental of it. And, you know, back then when I first um, started Groupon, um, like like Kaylee said, you know, just getting funded is just is like we were basically one of the first company who got acquired in in Indonesia, right? So, um, you know, even a small you know few millions dollars exit is was 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 great back then. But now you know you you get inspired by you know the story of Gojek, story of um, you know Grab, right? Raising billions of dollars, um, and that's what inspired me as a founder. To be able to, to you know to be able to reach that rather than you know um, letting off the letting go of the company at you know 10 20 50 50 million dollars but it also um, helps to have a bit of money in your pocket already right course, so yeah yes. <laughs> so you kind of taken care you know worst case scenario i'll still retire and not do anything yeah, for a while yeah. right so well that's the perks of starting early i guess <laughs> but, but i think that's important because i think secondary you know secondary share sale right is is incredibly important where when you think about like some of the especially first time founders you know, where they don't have much money and you want them to think big. So, you know, letting them take out some money out 
250, 500K, right? Enough for them to go, okay, buy a house, car, make wife happy, and now let's roll the dice, right? And so we start to see that some investors, right? Um, if, even for us, like we do investment, uh, we invest into, um, you know, fairly early stage, but we try to convince even the A guys or the Series B guys to go, look, let these guys pull some money out so they don't, they stop thinking short term, right? They stop thinking about making a quick buck and then doing that flip again, right? Because if we want long term growth out of this, just give them a little bit, right? And that's where, you know, for us, it's like, you know, it, you, you have kind of all these financial instruments and structures to really motivate, but it really depends on the founders. Some founders are definitely there for the flip, right? Where, you know, I mean, where I think then you also have the rest of the team. Some, you know, it's not just, the whole, all the group of founders, some of the founders can take the business a certain, you know, further, and some will want out early, right? So it's managing that, I think, is really tricky. Um, just, um, Robin, from your, you know, from your experience of, you know, talking to NASPER, you know, representing NASPERS, and how they look at Asia, the, the APAC region, right? Um, you know, are they still looking for buying more businesses, or it's more of like, you know, building, you know, just curious from a corporate strategy because they used to be MIH or NASPERS used to be very active, right? But we don't see that much, that many deals uh, anymore. No, you're right. Our base case is build ourselves, but we are very practical people. So um, uh, there's probably not a month that goes by without us buying a company, even when that's not our base case. Yeah. Uh, like um, uh, last week, we closed on um, uh, a company in South Africa, two companies in uh, Middle East. Um, uh, and who knows, uh, I can't tell you if something is now coming up in APEC, yes or no. Uh, probably when I say no, something will happen immediately after. <laughs> well, you buy some of our companies, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> nice. And, uh, and also, we, we do see that, you know, um, this trend now that, you know, you have these big conglomerates and corporates that, you know, they feel now that they can actually build faster and better, right? And with the lack of talent that, that you have in the region, right, buying a startup for a, a fairly hefty price might not make sense for some of them. And you start to see these now initiatives that they have of let's just try to build it in-house or, you know, recruit talent from, over, from overseas. I mean, do you see that happening in, in NASPERS itself, oh, where it's like a venture builder itself in, in terms of corporate? Yeah, we've, we've so many times fallen for the trap that we, uh, that we look at the buy versus build case and we say, ah, build by far much cheaper. But then in the end, we never build it because there's an opportunity cost. So I think that whole analysis is a little bit skewed. You need to keep your eyes open. If there's a good deal on the table, if there's a founder there who's really built a business uh, and it can, it can add to the business that we've already got, We'll always go for it. I think one aspect of that is interesting, right? Because I guess when we're buying something, the founder and seeing the cohesiveness of their teams, right? Whether the teams would stick around and whether they gel well with each other. You know, I'm, I'm pretty proud that um, the media company I built till today, the core management team, they love each other, you know? They're still there. Then all this uh, opportunity cost of not being a founder of startups or do something else, but they've built a community, a culture, that is very sticky, it's high performance, low ego, low, no politics, and, and just a lot of joy and love for each other. And, and that team sticks on like years after, and the cultures they create continues. And I think the word you use, the energy of the founders, right? The energy that still continues on. I think that's a real asset that sometimes um, it's hard to put a number on, right? Uh, just uh, you know, to some questions from you guys being founders, right? Like cash, versus equity in an acquisition, right? Where the business buys you, some of them will buy you for equity, some of them buy you for cash, right? What advice would you give, right? Let's just say, you know, you have the option, but what advice, what kind of advice would you give to first-time founders and when you sell your company, right? You know, should it be, you go for all cash, all equity? What's a good advice that you, that you guys can, you know, give to these, to these guys? I think it's very dependent on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, my advice would be, if you lose control of the company, it would, be, it, it would be best to take a cash. Because over time, when you have, you know, issue with, you know, the control over, over the company, it's just, it will spend a lot of your energy and time just to mandle over that, which will, you know, take, take away the opportunity to grow the, to grow the company. So... If um, 
if you get a, an equity but you still own control, you know, independently to grow the company, um, I would I would go with that because um, you know I I think uh, my position right now is to play long term, right? Uh, because I see the huge opportunity in this in the space, uh, but I think control as the founder um, who who built the company from zero is very important. And and you? Well, I think mean, that that echoes very well. I think that the founders got to ask themselves what they really want deep down inside, and if they really want to. If they care about like building a long-term business, they have a vision they want to go for, maybe the acquirer can help them achieve that vision. So if like OLX can really help, say, the Filipino folks really build a larger and more exciting platform, go along, really touch a lot of lives in the Philippines in meaningful ways. And if that's what the founder really, really wants, then maybe there's a deal can be struck for them to like be beneficiaries of that upside later on, right? And so that's what the founder really wants. But if the founder is like tired and like he's run the business for a few years already and the buyer doesn't actually want the founder and all they want is the assets, for example, right? Then at least be open about it and then like take cash off the table. You may get a crappier deal, but you know, you get your cash off the table and, and you, you go you go forward with that. Yeah, no, typically what we've seen is um, that we've given founders cash, but we like it when they keep an equity stake in the business uh, because then all of our incentives are aligned. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, like in the Philippines, RJ and Aryan, they kept the stake in the business uh, and only just recently uh, we bought that last stake of them uh, because, uh, uh, bless RJ and Aryan, they've been running the company for 10 years. That's, uh, uh, that's a respectable period. <laughs> that's a lifetime, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, I mean, for me, for me we, got, we, we always got this advice of like 50-50. Whatever 50, you can take cash off the table and obviously ride the, I mean, you know, or 60, 40, depending, right? But, you know, it was, it, we were considering, that we had, a, we had we, on, on the three exits, one of them was like more cash, like basically like oh, literally like an 80, 90% cash or like 50, 50, right? And we were going, wow, that cash looks really good, right? But it wasn't until, you know, I got advice from a corporate advisor who, who was, talking about a deal where, you know, he was advising a company that exited for, he cho they chose full cash, 100 million, versus like 300, 300 million of equity, right? 100 million in cash or 300 million in equity. And obviously these guys go 100 million in cash, we'll take that deal. But it just so happens that that acquirer was Facebook, right? So that 300 million in the very beginning now equates to 3 billion plus. And that's the story he told us. And we just went, shit, so I, we'll do 50-50, right? And, I mean, as we know, the daily deal space goes south, right? And in, in, in now in hindsight, we should have probably taken that 80%, 90% cash, right? And so the, you don't really have, you know what I mean? Like, you just need to know the scenarios, right? But so we thought that how could living social really be that bad because you have 700 million in funding and it's 35% owned by Amazon, right? So you have to make your like, you know, you, you have to think about all the different, you know, the details before you make that decision. But in, in, in my experience, it's kind of like whatever you get out in cash up front, you should almost be happy that in some ways everything else is like cream, right? It's upside. Whether it's your cash earnout or it's equity in that company, right? But roughly, you should almost be content because we exited agency deals before, ad network deals, like the daily deals, right? And so, you know, I mean, there's always these earnouts that you never know. And what you're saying, which is, if you lose control, I mean, you want to pull out as much cash as possible, right? Actually, I guess in the end day, you win some, you lose some. Kind of a first world problem is you know, it's like, yeah. oh, I'm not happy with my 50 million. You know, I could have gotten 500 million. You know? It's but, never enough, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I think contentment, gratitude. You know, kind of having a sense of humility going through these things and a, a, a touch of humanity going through these things. I think looking back on all of these years where we're like busting, busting our ass, kind of building things. You know, like, I guess as long as you feel good about it, right? You kind of be really, really grateful for for the journey, however it turned out. I think that's the biggest win. No, definitely. And, and my word of advice as well, it's just, you know, if you can get a corporate advisor to help you and when you're for advice, don't try to think you can do it all on your own. And we were very lucky to actually be able to get a corporate advisor to help us in this process. And that, for me, was useful because my brothers and I, we were kicking ourselves under the table going, shit, this offer they gave is awesome, right? 
and then the corporate advisor comes in two days and doubled that value of that business. And that's when, that's when you realize the, the real value of you know, what these guys do, right? Yeah, we also appreciate it because often in a cap table, there's so many people involved in a deal and to have someone to really orchestrate all of the sales side and um, it, it can really help a deal. It's interesting. I've and never these, heard these, of that. These it's days usually we don't like them. We hate them because yeah. they're, they're creating the bidding wars, right? But it's very interesting to get it from that perspective. Like right. From this perspective, it's probably like maybe there's some folks on the cap table who may not be that cooperative. So instead of you like rounding up, hurting all the cats, you got somebody else to hurt the cats, and then that, that kind of at least the deal actually happens. Right? And, and, and it depends on the situation, right? Because if there's clearly control in one party, hey, uh, no need for advisors from our pr perspective. Yes. But if it's, uh, uh, if it's more of a mixed bag and uh, there's many people to be coordinated, uh, uh, it's a job that needs doing. That's I think in this day and age as well, like uh, the, a lot of corporate advisors that a lot of startups use to get a lot of these deals done are the VCs themselves, yeah. right? So amongst VCs, like I've been part of so many deals where amongst the VCs on the table, like, okay, we've got this deal on the table. Which of us is going to lead the negotiations? That we sign a paper, we say, okay, you go lead it. We're behind you. We'll agree with, you know, all of us are aligned. Go and represent us. So that kind of at least makes things a little bit easy for the founder so you don't have to round up too many people. I mean, so that is emerging a little bit these days. Do you hear that? If your founder is, like, leverage your VC to do that. Yeah. Yeah, and, th and that also helps if the VCs are aligned because I've, I've recently been in a deal where um, there was clear control, so it should have been relatively straightforward, but one of the VCs at the very last minute makes a counter bid and it just creates a mess. In the end, the bid wasn't real, and, uh, but it just adds to the process. <laughs> Sorry, guys, like if they're flagging us. We're, at, we're out of time. Again, appreciate it. It was uh, you know, very insightful, and uh, thanks a lot for your, uh, your useful f or feedback. Thank you. Okay, th thanks, Paul. Hey, thanks.